Hello! Welcome back to my channel. And today, we will discuss linear programming models or the resource allocation models. So what is meant by linear programming? When we say linear programming, it is a mathematical technique for finding the best uses of an organization's resources. This means that this is the technique that helps managers whenever they want to allocate the available limited resources for various competing activities for achieving their desired objective. We need to understand that every business organization has two objectives. First, First is to maximize the profits and second is to minimize the cost, okay? Second, linear programming has been defined as a method of dealing with decision problems that can be expressed as constrained linear models. This is quite difficult to comprehend, but what it means is that linear programming is one of the most versatile powerful and useful technique for making management decisions. And as a decision-making tool, it has demonstrated its value in various fields. It can be applied in production, where you are trying to maximize your profits and at the same time minimize the cost of your raw materials. It can also be applied in finance, in marketing, in research and development, and even in personal management aspects. And lastly, linear programming is defined or is used to find minimum cost, maximum profits, maximum amount of earning that can take place under a given condition. Now, we know for a fact that the objective of each business enterprise, like I said earlier, is to make a profit, right? Now, in order to do that, we should be a customer-centered, we should be a customer-oriented organization. What I mean about that is that we should involve our customers in the manufacture of our product. And how are we supposed to do that? Simply, we need to collect the voice of our customers or the VOC. The voice of our customers uh, may include customers' inquiries, customer complaints, customer suggestions, etc. And then we need to translate it into some kind of customer specifications and to make sure that the organization is able to meet these specifications or requirements to achieve customer satisfaction. Right now, we will also discuss the properties of linear programming models. And there are four uh, properties that I'm going to discuss to you today. The first property is the relationship between variables and constraints must be linear. Second, the model must have objective function. Third, the model must have structural constraints. And lastly, the model must have non-negative constraints. Now, in order for now, in order for us to better understand what these properties really mean, let us discuss first the different terminologies used in linear programming. Now, one of the terminologies that we normally use, that would be decision variables. When we say decision variables, this refer to mathematical symbols representing levels of activity of a firm. So it can be the variables A and B, it can be the variables X and Y, or it can be X sub 1, X sub 2, or Y sub 1, Y sub 2, okay? These are mathematical symbols. Moving on, we have constraints. And when we say constraints, these are requirements or restrictions placed on the firm by the operating environment stated in the linear relationships of the decision variables. Now, there are two types of constraints. First, we have structural explicit or non-negativity or also known as the implicit constraint. When we say structural or explicit constraint, it refers to a limit on the availability of resources. For example, 
under production department, let's just say um, the capacity of our machine, that would be 40 machine hours. So therefore, we should not exceed on 40 hours because that's the only availability, uh, the limitations of the capacity of our machine. So that's what we call structural or explicit constraint. And when we say non-negativity, it restricts or variables to zero or positive. So for non-negativity, um, the numbers or the quantities should not be in negative form. It can either be equal to zero or it can either be higher than zero. But we will discuss this one uh, further in order for us to better understand what really structural or non-negativity constraints are. Another terms that we normally use in linear programming, that would be the objective function. Objective function is a linear mathematical relationship describing an objective of the firm in terms of decision variables. In linear programming, we are normally faced with two decisions. It's either we maximize the profit or we minimize the cost. So that's normally the objectives of the firm. Parameters, on the other hand, these are numerical coefficients and constants used in the objective function and constraints. And aside from that, we have feasible region. This is a set of combination of values for the decision variables that satisfy the non-negatively conditions and all the constraints simultaneously, that is the allowable decisions. Now, as you can see on the figure presented at the left portion, you have their feasible region. So that is where it is located. And aside from that, we have two lines intersecting each other. So below that line or below that are those lines, uh, the boundary that would be our physical region. And we also have what we call extreme point. Extreme point is the corner of the feasible region. If a linear programming problem has a solution, then there is always at least one extreme point solution, okay? And optimal solution, this is a combination of decision variable amounts that yield the best possible value of the objective function and satisfy all the constraints. So as long as it satisfies all the constraints, then we have what we call optimal solution. And when we say multiple optimal solution, the condition in which a linear programming has more than one optimal solution. And if we say infeasibility, this is the case where there is no feasible solution which satisfies all constraints or there are no points that satisfy all constraints. So if there is something that has been not followed or if there is something that is not being satisfied, then we call that one as infeasibility. When I say not being satisfied, I'm referring to the constraints, okay? We also have what we call redundancy. Redundancy is a constraint which does not affect the physical feasible region. As you can see on the presented figure, uh, you have their redundant constraint, okay? That is presented in some sort of a vertical line. And as you can notice, it does not affect our physical or feasible region. And when we say unbounded, this is the condition when the objective function of a linear programming problem can be infinitely large without violating any of our constraints. As you can see, our feasible region is very infinitely large, okay? And now in order for us to better understand these terminologies of linear programming, let's have an example. So our example states, a company manufactures two products. We have product X and product Y, which require the following resources. The resources are the capacities of machines. So in this particular example, we have three machineries. We have machine one, 
machine two and machine three. The available capacities are 50, 25, and 15 hours respectively in the planning period. Your product X requires one hour of machine two and one hour of machine three. And your product Y requires two hours of machine one, two hours of machine two, and one hour of machine three. And the profit contribution of X and Y products are $5 and $4 respectively. Now, since we are presented with these data or pieces of information, we have technically collected our data already. And once we are done with data collection, what we need to do next is to analyze our data. There are a lot, couple of ways to analyze our data. It can be through tabulations or graphical forms. But for this matter, we will make use of tabulation. We will tabulate the data given in order for us to better understand for better comprehension. So as you can see, the contents of the statement can be summarized as follows. So I've made uh, three columns. You have uh, columns for your machine, a column for your product, and a column for your availability of your machines in terms of hours. Remember that we have three different machines, machine one, machine two, and machine three. And also you have two different products. You have product X and product Y. And the availability of your machines as well. Availability meaning these are the capacities of your three different machines. So for machine one, you have 50 hours, machine two, 25, and machine three, you have 15 hours. Now with respect to product X, remember that your product X does not need machine one. It only requires machines two and three. So for machine two, it requires one hour. And for machine three, it also requires um, one hour with a profit of $5 per unit. And for product Y, it requires all three machines. So for the first machine, it requires two hours two hours for machine two and one hour for machine three. And remember that its profit margin is $4 per unit. Now, how do we solve this type of problem? Now, in solving this type of problem, we need to strictly follow these model formulation steps. Now, the reason we need to follow these is for us to be guided, for us to be directed in properly answering the problem scenario. Now, the first model formulation step that we need to do is to clearly define the decision variables. Second, we need to construct the objective function. And lastly, we need to formulate the constraints. Now let's have step one first. It says, clearly define the decision variables. Remember that in our terminologies, we have defined decision variables which refer to mathematical symbol symbols, right? So as you can notice here in our problem, our problem states a company manufactures two products, X and Y. So apparently, our decision variables, that would be product X and product Y, or it can be brand X or brand Y, if you're comfortable using that, okay? Again, our decision variables, that would be product X and product Y. Now, based on our problem, it is already apparent that our two decision variables are your product X and Y. After defining our decision variables, the next step we need to do is to construct the objective function. Now, in order to do that, in constructing the objective function, we need to go back first to our tabulation for us to be having uh, a good visual on the information. Now, as you can see, machine capacities are available resources, right? Profit contribution of the products X and Y are also given. We have $5 and $4 respectively. 
Now, having this information, the question now is, are we now able to formulate the model? Yes, we actually are. But how do we do that? In order to do that, let the company manufactures X units of product X and Y units of product Y. As the profit contribution of products X and Y are $5 and $4 respectively. So it is very clear now that the objective of the problem is to maximize profits. Okay, so how do we write that one? So in order to write that one, we may say maximize Z equals 5X plus 4Y, where Z refers to your profit per day, where 5 refers to your profit of your product X, and 4 refers to your profit margin to your product Y, okay? So that's the decision of the company. They need to maximize their profit. So therefore, uh, we are finally done with step number two. And after constructing the objective function, the last step that we need to do is to formulate the constraints. Now, how do we do that? In doing that, let's move on first, or let's go back rather to our tabulation for a better visual. Now, in order to formulate the constraints, again, as defined earlier, constraints refer to the requirements or restrictions placed on the firm by the operating environment stated in the linear relationships of the decision variables. And so going back, we need to consider the utilization of our machine hours. So how many machines do we have again? We have three. Now, as you can see, each machine has its corresponding capacity. For machine one, we have a capacity of 50 hours. Machine two has 25 hours. And finally, machine three has 15 hours. This being considered the utilization of machine hours by product X and product Y should not exceed the available capacity. So our linear structural constraint that should be this one. So this is how it looks like, okay? So we have to create three linear structural constraints. Why three? Because we have uh, three machines. So with respect to machine one, so our first linear structural constraint, that would be 0x plus 2y, less than or equal to 50. Because if we try to go back to our tabulation as to how we come up with those um, numbers and constants, okay, going back there. So as you can see, uh, it should be 0x with respect to machine one. So our first linear structure, that would be 0x plus 2y less than or equal to 50 hours. Why did we use an inequality of less than or equal to 50 hours? Remember, the reason is because we are trying to maximize the profit. However, the condition is we should not exceed from our capacity. And our capacity is 50 hours. So that is why we make use of less than or equal to inequality. And our second linear structural constraint, that would be 1x plus 2y less than or equal to 25. And lastly, for machine three, our linear structural constraint that would be 1x plus 1y less than or equal to 15. Now that we have formulated, now that we have formulated our constraint, so what's next? Well, actually, we're not done yet. We are not done yet because we also need to consider that the company may decide either to stop the production of products X and Y, or they may also decide to manufacture any amount of products X and Y. So remember, supposing you are the company and you are trying to decide not 
to produce any amount of product. That means to say that there is no production. So the quantity of your products, that would be equal to zero. On the other hand, if you decide to produce or manufacture any amount of products X and Y, so therefore, the quantity of your products would be greater than zero. So that is now non-negativity constraint comes in. So our non-negativity constraint should be written as X is greater than or equal to zero. Y is greater than or equal to zero. Or it can be also written as X and Y greater than or equal to zero. Or it can be both X and Y are greater than or equal to zero. Now, as you can see, as the problem has got objective function, structural constraints and non-negativity constraints and there existing a linear relationship between the variables and the constraints in the form of inequalities, the problem then satisfies the properties of the linear programming problem. However, there are also basic assumptions for this particular problem, and I will be discussing the seven basic assumptions. Now, the first assumption that we have, it is assumed that the decision maker here is completely certain. When we say completely certain, he or she is in deterministic condition regarding all aspects of the situation. May it be about the availability of resources, the profit contribution of products, the technology or the machineries and equipment used, the courses of action taken and their consequences, okay? That's our first assumption. The second assumption, it is assumed that the relationship between variables in the problem and the resources available or the constraints of the problem exhibit linearity. Here, the term linearity implies proportionality or additivity. This assumption is very useful as it simply uh, simplifies modeling of the problem. And the third basic assumption that we have, we assume here fixed technology. What do we mean by that? When we say fixed technology, we are actually referring to the fact that the production requirements are fixed during the planning period. And the fourth one, it is assumed that the profit contribution of a product remains constant irrespective of level of production and sales. When we see remains constant, it doesn't change regardless whether or not you add the production of your products X and Y or you deduct or you lessen the production of your X and Y. It's still the same, it's still fixed, okay? And the fifth one, it is assumed that the decision variables are continuous. If we say continuous, it means that companies manufacture products in fractional units. For example, company manufactures 2.5 vehicles or 3.2 barrels of oil, etc. This is also referred to as the assumption of divisibility. Okay, that's what continuous uh, mean. For number six assumption, it is assumed that only one decision is required for the planning period. For this one, this condition shows that the linear programming model is a static model, which implies that linear programming problem is a single stage decision problem. On the other hand, dynamic programming problem is a multi-stage decision problem. And finally, the last assumption that would be all variables are restricted to non-negative values, or either numerical value will be greater than or equal to zero, okay?